Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief update on all of our upcoming programs. For those of you who would like to ask Katie and our moderator questions today, there's a QA, um, there's a, a control panel, excuse me, on the right hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the QA portion of today's program, which should start in about 35 minutes. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce today's program, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel. We are joined here by Katie. She is Katie Martin is the author of The Chancellor, an intimate human story of Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel's rise and reign. She will be joined in conversation with the president of the American Council on Germany, Stephen Sokol. Hi, Stephen. The program is part of the World Affairs Councils of America series, Germany's Elections and the Future of Transatlantic Relations, held under the auspices of Wunderbar Together 2021, and in partnership with the American Council on Germany and Atlantic Brücke. It is so such an honor to have you both here today. Welcome, welcome. And let me turn this over to you, Stephen, and get it started. Thank you both. Thank you. Well, Kim, thank you so much. Um, I am truly honored to be able to have this conversation today with Kati Martin. Um, she is, as I think everybody knows, a best-selling author and award-winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent. Um, today, we get a sneak peek into her latest book, uh, which I'm lucky enough to have a copy of. It's called The Chancellor, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel. And this book is going to be released um, at the end of next month. So it's a real treat um, Kati, to, to have you with us today for your very first book talk. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It's, it's really my honor and my pleasure. And uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, um, well, the book is, is, a, is the remarkable odyssey of Angela Merkel, but it's also been a remarkable four-year odyssey for me trying to pierce the mystery of this most mysterious public persona. Um, we don't know very much about her. In fact, I, as her biographer, I'm frequently asked by Germans, does the chancellor have grandkids? So, I mean, that is the level of privacy with which she has surrounded herself, which is, when you think about it, uh, pretty remarkable given, you know, the social mediatic age that we, that we all swim in. So it's been, it's been an exhausting and sometimes frustrating um, uh, journey for me, but uh, you, you be the judge of, uh, of whether I, whether I succeeded in piercing the mystery of, uh, of Merkel. Well, Katya, I, I think it is a, a remarkable portrait of, as you indicated, an extremely private person who has often been described as an enigma. Um, when we were in the green room before we went live, you described her as the most consequential politician of our time. I think that there are a lot of people who would agree with that and we'll talk undoubtedly about some of her politics and, and what made her the most consequential politician of our time. But as you said, you've also kind of been living in her head for four years and I'm looking forward to, to talking with you today and, and trying to unpack um, some of that. What I found striking as I was reading the book is how you really take um, a human approach rather than a political approach to telling the story of Angela Merkel, uh, and it was fascinating to read um, about the, the literally dozens of, of very candid interviews that you were able to have with close advisors, um, but also with teachers and classmates. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so you've painted quite a, a portrait mm -hmm. of this person that we know so little about. But I, 
as I was reading it, um, it, one of the the thoughts that stayed with me throughout the entire book was that um, you devote a lot of time in the early chapters to talking about the upbringing of a pastor's daughter who was born in Hamburg but grew up in East Germany and how that impacted her worldview uh, and her time as chancellor. And so I'd like to, to maybe start by having you talk a little bit about her background and what makes her so unique. Well, uh, yes, thanks, Steve. Uh, so she was uh, born in the West, and unlike uh, the vast majority of Germans um, still reeling from World War II, uh, her family moved from West to East, so right into the the jaws of the of the of the Soviet army and and the new uh, people, so-called peoples. Um, democracy of, of East Germany, the socialist side, because her father was a rather, I would say, um, almost fanatical believer in, uh, in socialism. Uh, the daughter would part ways with the father later on in her political life. But the father um, was a powerful personality and a, and, and a, a powerful influence on the chancellor. Bear in mind that that the chancellor um, did not cross from back from East Germany to West Germany until age 35. So of course, uh, these were the formative years. I think in any any uh, biography, the most interesting uh, chapters are about the the youth and formation. You know, because that's when we become who we are. And, and she was bred, raised and bred in a closed surveillance state, the Stasi state. And this is key to who she became because we've already touched on the fact that, that, that she is the most private public person probably in the world. Well, where does that come from? It comes from this early sense of, of, um, of, of the necess necessity to keep her own counsel, that informants were everywhere, that you could really not trust anyone. And I just have to forgive me for saying this, but I grew up in a similar society. Uh, I too am a, a product of, uh, of the Cold War and we're rough contemporaries. And, and I grew up in, in Cold War Budapest, a uh, child of so-called enemies of the state. My, my parents were arrested when, uh, uh, for, for political crimes when I was six years old. So I had a, a, an, a, a kind of a fundamental understanding and sympathy for her upbringing um, and, and for her need to um, be suspicious uh, of the world. So she grows up in, in Brandenburg province, um, always the brightest kid in every class, but in a state where calling attention to yourself was dangerous. Therefore, she's always sitting in the back of the class. I did, as you pointed out, interview her teachers and who always uh, saw the girls, the, the girl Angela's brilliance. But uh, for example, her Russian teacher, uh, and she was a prize-winning Russian uh, student, um, was frustrated by her lack of, of, of performance skills, shall we call it. Again, foreshadowing um, a quality we associate with, with Merkel the Chancellor. You know, a, a, a rather, how shall we put it, politely dull uh, speaker. Um, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that that okay, she knows she's brilliant. She's not lacking in in ego or self confidence, but she does not want to stand out. So she always tamps down uh, performance. Um, so we're covering a lot of territory here, but but she goes from from the small town in in Brandenburg, uh, pastor's daughter, who by the way is raised in the company of handicapped. Uh, children and people. And, and this too plays uh, an enormous role in, in, in the, the woman and the politician that she became. Fast forward to 2015, which I'm sure we will about refugees. Those who knew her back then 
understood that her natural compassion was bred in the bone as the daughter of this pastor who was raised with with people who needed extra extra care and and the bible played a huge role what what really stood out to me um was you know the the curiosity that that she demonstrated as a as a young child yeah. um and as you just described sort of this empathy and those are both characteristics and traits um that one sees in her as as chancellor as well um but in the gdr it was it was rare for the child of a pastor uh to be able to go to university um and it was very interesting sort of to to read your account of you know her curiosity uh bringing her to pursue the sciences the fact that marie curie was sort of her role model in in many senses can you yes. talk a little bit about sort of her university days Yes. So, um, so she was. Um, they couldn't stop her. She was. She was too brilliant to be um, to be blocked from a university education, which um, other children of of her social background. She 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 to be a pastor. However much he her father sympathized with socialism was was not a great advantage in an atheist state. Obviously, so she had to overcome that. Um, but she was unstoppable as as the you know valedictorian in every in every class. Um, so she goes off to Leipzig Universe, University. She chooses one of the you know stellar institutions, even in uh, under under uh, socialism, and and she um, she goes off to to um, Leipzig and chooses science because science was. Uh, somewhat freer of of the long reach of the state, but not entirely. She was always always under surveillance, and and um, she was always managing her. You know, she she she, she would not then or now um, go out on a limb um, uh, for any cause until again we'll get to refugees. Mm -hmm eventually um that was that was her 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 probably her most uh spontaneous and and throwing caution to the wind if you were if you will but in in leipzig um she um she she becomes the independent person that that uh, really really uh distancing herself from from her father and 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 building the tremendous self-confidence that would come in uh, so handy and also a getting accustomed to being the only in whatever setting only woman in the in the setting and and this too would serve her well so that started in class so that's actually a, a great a great segue um I, I think you have to fill in sort of one mosaic piece yes. of um how she got involved in politics because she was certainly on a on a trajectory um, to be a scientist. Obviously, there were global events such as the fall of the wall that disrupted her career. Um, yes. But but I'd love to hear your account of how she got involved in politics. And and then in the book you describe how she rose to the top. Um, and and I I really think we need to talk about that before we come to her time as as chancellor. Right, right. Yeah, we're covering a lot of territory here, but of course, the the um, the fall of the of the wall in 1989 uh, was uh, was her liberation as well as that of, of um, East Germany. She uh, at that point decided that science was uh, was was not as exciting <laughs> as politics. She started walking around her her East Berlin uh, neighborhood of Kreuzberg and and kind of randomly walked into a political startup. Up and was uh, and was turned on by by this freewheeling discussion about the future of, of the country that was being forged, and um, her we 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 um, again fast forward to to um, her her um, mentoring by some of the great politicians, all men of course, um, of of those days of those um, early German unification days. And and Lothar de Maizière, who was the uh, one and only um, popularly elected um, president of, of East Germany before East and West were 
merged, made her his, uh, his press spokesman. And quite characteristically, she, she displayed a ruthlessness, which would also speed her ascent, um, with Lothar, um, with whom I did a, uh, a very long interview. And he, to this day, um, much as he admires her, he, uh, he, there's a residual bitterness about the fact that when he got in trouble, um, uh, because, because there were rumors, false rumors of Stasi uh, connections, um, she didn't stick up for him. Um, she, uh, that, that was kind of a pattern for her. And of course, her boldest political act have, having had de Maizière introduce her and encourage Helmut Kohl, Chancellor Kohl, the titanic figure of, 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 uh, uh, uni of, of unification and, and Cold War uh, Germany, who everybody in, in this smart audience uh, knows about. Helmut Kohl was advised by, the, by de Maizière to, to uh, launch uh, Merkel. And, and of course, she she basically ended Cole's career when he got in trouble. Uh, she correctly, I think, because because Cole was was uh, had, had become a liability for the CDU, but no one else in in the CDU hierarchy had the chutzpah, <laughs> the the political nerve to say, okay, Helmut, clear the stage for the new generation. Angela Merkel wrote a, um, a, a shocking uh, opinion piece in the Frankfurter Allgemeine uh, saying it's time to move on. And that, and, and, and um, goodbye, Helmut. Uh, and, and that made her the natural heir to, to become the chair of the CDU and eventually um, chancellor, um, you know, making 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 history as the first woman chancellor in a country that uniquely in Europe never even had a queen. I, I think these two vignettes that you've shared um, with Lothar de Maizière and, and Helmut Kohl sort of underscore um, what sort of an incredible moral compass she has uh, yes. and what sort of high standards and expectations yes. she has of, of those around her. Um, yeah. But one of the things that that I'd love to have you unpack just a little bit more is is you know you you talked before about how when she was in the classroom she'd sit at the back um, when she got into politics she was unassuming I think many people underestimated her um, but she did show that she had uh, sharp elbows and and could be ruthless yeah. when she needed to be Absolutely. and one of the lessons that that she learned from Helmut Kohl was sort of then how to eliminate some of the competition that might be coming up behind them. Um, yeah. And so when she came after Cole, he didn't see it coming at all. No, no. He was in a long line of, of um, men who always underestimated her. Um, and, uh, and that was part of her genius, actually, is that she played to that. Um, she, um, she didn't, she was not a showy politician. She, um, always, always knew her facts, um, at, but used them sparingly like Conrad Adenauer used a very limited vocabulary, but, uh, but she was a great observer and learned from, from, uh, all of them. Um, Henry Kissinger was an early mentor. Uh, he called on her, much to her surprise, uh, in her early days when Cole had made her minister for, for women and youth, uh, mm -hmm. two, two, two subjects she was not at all interested in, by the way, but she was right. biding her time. Um, and from there, from there, she went on to minister uh, for environment, which was much more um, in, in her wheelhouse, if you will, and um, and and hopefully we'll get into her, 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 her environmental commitment, which, which has, has um, to her regret and, and ours, I think, remained unfulfilled largely mm -hmm. because her, her 16 years as chancellor have really been a series of crises. So crises 
uh, led to crises. And um, uh, eventually, she she was hoping to get back to to climate change, yeah. the big issue. And then, of course, came the ultimate crisis, um, COVID. So she never has. But I, I hold out hope that uh, that um, as she leaves to begin um, her her final act, because she's still young enough to have a a, a third act, um, climate will be will be on the forefront. Sorry, Steve, I jumped I jumped no. way ahead there. Free associating. You did you did jump forward, um, and we will come back to to some of these topics, but. Um, I'd like to go back to the the beginning of her time in office yeah. and 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 you tell our viewers that you know she was elected in 2005. Um, she had a razor thin electoral victory. There were a number of people who really did not expect much from her. Her critics did not think that she would last very long. And here we are, 16 years later, and there is a whole generation of young Germans who cannot remember a time when Angela Merkel was not. The chancellor and so i think for us to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of her influence at home but then looking at some of those crises that you started to touch on in the international arena um because one of the things that i found really interesting in the book is how you describe how she went about really transforming germany into a more liberal society um this was not done in a heavy-handed way but a way that she sort of like a puppeteer managed. Um, and I, I think it would be fascinating to hear, you know, your take on, on how she did that and, and what those priorities were. Right, great. Okay, you've set me up brilliantly. And and part of the reason that I was I was leaping ahead was was that uh, I want to I'm I'm keenly aware of time and, and I, I know we're gonna uh, take questions. Um, so I, um, what what really um, surprised me in uh, well many things. She's really not who we think she is. I mean, she's she is um, anything but um, a, um, a, a a cautious politician. Although she appears to be cautious, but in fact, and by the way, she's very funny. Uh, let me just surprise the uh, the audience perhaps with that fact is that she's got a wicked sense of humor. Uh, her motives are complex. Um, of course, she wanted to do good. She's a uh, uh, her church is is very important to her, but very again very private. Her faith, I should say. Um, so when she got to the um, chancellery, uh, she uh, 2005. She um, the 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 sun was shining and and she had just defeated um, uh, her her predecessor Gerhard Schroeder in a typical Merkel power move. That is to say, she let this bombastic um, male politician um, uh, bloviate while she she leaned back and uh, and watched uh, until the moment came uh, for her to strike. And that moment came when 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 uh, Schroeder in this in the famous Alafantrund, as it's called, uh, uh, an ordeal for German politicians on the eve of being elected, uh, he Schroeder couldn't believe that he Gerhard Schroeder was defeated by this woman from the East, a scientist. Who? What? No. And so so he he kind of unraveled, and then she leaned into the microphone, typical move, and said. Uh, it's clear that um, that you you were not elected, and that we're not going to uh, turn democratic norms upside down. And at that point, her her really her career was made. And so uh, Schroeder, like 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 Cole and so many others, underestimated her. And then we we fast forward um, to her longest and most complex relationship on the world stage, and that's with Vladimir Putin. She and Putin um, have been locked in a um, in a bad marriage for um, well for 16 years, and he Putin is the only one who's who had who outlasted only one of the of the world leaders who has outlasted uh, Merkel because she um, of course had outlasted Trump, which was very important to her, although perhaps not Trumpism, but that's another topic. 
Um, but but the relationship with with Putin has been crucial um, to the world because uh, um, Putin um, respects her, talks to her. They literally speak each other's languages because Putin learned uh, his very good German as a KGB officer in Dresden, and and uh, and Merkel was a, um, a Russian stu a student of Russian language um, since high school. So I, I had a chance to ask her um, not long ago um, which language they, they now speak. And she said that, well, now they, they speak um, German because, because his German is so good and, and her Russian has gotten rusty. But, but of course, when, um, when the Ukraine uh, crisis hit uh, Europe with, with uh, Putin unleashing uh, his forces in Crimea, she was the one who Obama basically empowered to negotiate on behalf of the West. And, and, and she did so successfully. Um, it's a cold piece, but it's, uh, but it, it, insofar as, as he stopped his, his, his uh, waging his campaign, it's because of her dogged negotiation. There's no one who is more willing to stay at the table till the last cow comes home or whatever the cliche is. Uh, no one um, on, the, on the world stage who can beat her at negotiation. And of course, Barack Obama, with whom she had a sometimes complex relationship, all was not smooth sailing there. She, she was from the outset rather wary of him because why? Because he's everything she's not, a charismatic speaker. And uh, and she was put off that that uh, that he wanted to give his first speech at the Brandenburg Gate, which she thought was presumptuous. Um, well, but but of course, there was something there was something else, um, namely the the NSA affair, where um, yeah. her phone was bugged, and particularly given the fact that um, she is such a private person, to have the United States, to have a, a democratic American president um, um, listening in. Yes. was also um, a, a source of irritation, if one will. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, your, your, your colleague, uh, John Emerson, um, uh, told me that that, um, that, that uh, episode of the, of the tapping of her cell phone um, really created a, 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 a wasted year between Washington and, and Berlin because things got so mm -hmm. chilly, mm -hmm. but uh, but because she's pragmatic um, and and frankly is willing to s sublimate her ego, which is one of her um, most uh, uh, useful qualities, is that she doesn't let ego get uh, between herself and results. Uh, she got over that, and uh, as she had to, so that in, uh, the, ultimately um, she and Obama um, forged a. Uh, um, Obama, Obama, Obama said, uh, Ben Rhodes, his, his, his aide, told me that insofar as he had a close relationship with any head of state, he did with Merkel. In fact, uh, um, uh, Ben Rhodes uh, characterizes it as love. Um, I'm not sure it was mutual, yeah. but strangely, if I can just uh, uh, surprise uh, the, the, our, our uh, audience, um, she got along... Uh, the chemistry between between Merkel and George W. Bush was stronger, according to aides on both sides, mm -hmm. than, than with Obama. You know, you wouldn't think so, but they got along. They got along very well, and and have maintained. Uh, that that is interesting. That's not necessarily something that one might think um, when one thinks of the image of of George W. Bush sort of giving. Mm -hmm. Miracle, the massage um, that yes, that and her that arms going up. Looking. Yeah, I love. Yeah, that yeah. picture went viral that summer. Yeah, but but again, to reinforce my earlier point, that that uh, many things about her will surprise uh, my readers. Um, she really defies uh, because because she's so succeeded in keeping us at bay. She doesn't think mm -hmm. any of this is our business. Beyond, you know, what goes on in the chancellery, maybe. But beyond that, no. Her relationships, no. Well, and that's what's so fascinating about how you you parse the chancellor and how you sort of peel back the layers and and get at what makes her tick. And so, you know, we've we've touched on this a couple of times um, when when she took office. 
it was a period of relative stability, um, but there were a whole series of crises that hit Europe um, in, in very quick succession shortly after she came into office. Um, perhaps the first big one was the, the Euro um, zones debt crisis, which started to unfold in, in 2008, 2009. Um, and Merkel really helped lead efforts to, to save the, the Euro. Um, yeah. I, you know, her, her big quote at the time was, if the Euro fails, Europe, Europe. fails. Mm -hmm. um, this led to very negative uh, press and feelings in other parts of Europe, and I'm thinking particularly about, about Greece. But that was sort of um, the, the first big crisis of several crises. I mean, 2015, another Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis that we've touched on, which perhaps was the most defining moment in her, in her career. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic, and, and you alluded to climate. So let's talk a little bit about how she navigated these crises and how she felt responsible, not only for Germany, but yeah. for Europe. Yes, yes. Well, she navigates uh, crises um, with, uh, with several unique qualities that she has. One, stamina. She does not need more than about five hours of sleep. She, she characterizes herself. She says, I'm like a camel. I store up sleep. And then when the crisis is over, I sleep, but not before. And so uh, during, uh, during Ukraine, during, during the Euro crisis, I mean, she was, uh, she was all over the map. She was relentless in her pursuit. She made herself very unpopular with, with pushing. She became the queen of austerity. The one and only time that that she actually wept in public, uh, and this was provoked by Obama, was was uh, at a G7 where she was just unwilling to um, to 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 lift the the uh, the German ban on on uh, on loosening money for the for the neediest in Europe because you know the the Germans mm -hmm. believe. Uh, in, in austerity and everybody should should uh, live within their means. Well, tell that to the Greeks who who are uh, out of work and and with trash piling up in Athens. And so she was burnt in effigy. And um, and and when she all finally visited uh, Athens, she was shocked at at seeing images of herself with a with a Hitler mustache depicted everywhere. That was a sobering moment for her. Um, and she learned from that. That's the other thing, Steve, about Merkel is that she learns from her mistakes because she's not an ideologue. She she um, she looks for solutions. She she um, she has her core uh, morality, you know, based as we've mentioned on her Lutheran values and her her uh, her belief in public service. And and then the other quality is that that she is an optimist. She's an action driven optimist. So she unlike most politicians, she never became cynical in the course of this long career. So she she always for her. And she says this a lot. The image of Sisyphus rolling that rock up the mountain, even if it's just a few inches and then that's not a negative image for her. That is what she's about, the quiet and persistent work of, uh, and, and how many politicians um, have, have the patience or, or the self-confidence uh, to do that quiet and, and persistent work? Uh, you know, it's what, I, I can't think of another one, uh, which is what makes her departure, frankly, a source of, well, worry for, for many of us is that, is that you mentioned that for, for, uh, for a whole generation, she is, uh, like for our, our parents and grandparents, FDR was the only president they knew. Um, so it is with, with Germans. She is, she is the face of, of the chancellery. So we'll, that, that will create an enormous challenge for, for her successors. So um, again, we're, we're covering a lot of uh, territory here, but, but let me just, let me just um, uh, go back to 2015, because to be honest with you, um, until 2015, I did not think that she was a particularly compelling uh, public um, uh, figure. And it was in 2015 that I decided that I wanted to do this book. Uh, because because of how she um, 
her, her remarkable courage during the refugee crisis, where she, where she enabled one million uh, mostly Middle Eastern refugees coming from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, et cetera, um, to enter Germany. And by the way, one million uh, Middle Eastern um, refugees in Germany has not uh, tipped the balance. It is on, on German society. Um, and in fact, it's pretty much a back burner issue by now. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, simultaneously, uh, Orban in Hungary was, you know, putting up, putting up um, chain link fences and, mm -hmm. and using bayonets to drive, drive um, refugees uh, back uh, to Serbia where they came from. Um, and, and, um, and, and uh, David Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron was calling them a swarm. And of course, the United States was, was pathetically um, uh, skimpy in, in its refugee policy. She uniquely um, stood for, for a, a compassionate policy toward, toward refugees who were not Germany's right. problem. Really, it was so. This was this was um, Merkel at her best. I can't imagine why she didn't get the Nobel Peace Prize. But by the way, she's not interested. That's another. That's another quality. She's she doesn't. She's not about prizes. No, she's she's definitely not. She's very sachlich, right? It's about the issues at hand. And I, I think you know when talking about the migration crisis and and all of the things that you said. Um, one important point, and I think this is one of the criticisms that one hears within Germany, um, is that her position on migration provided an opening for yeah. the alternative for Germany, for the, the far right. And, and that has sort of changed the political landscape right. and calculus yes. in Germany. Absolutely, undeniably, uh, the the AfD is, is, is also a product of the Merkel era. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that the IFD is not exactly soaring in its uh, in its in its support. It's gone pretty quiet now. Um, these these uh, extremists are 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 not that uh, enthusiastic about taking on um, you know a global pandemic because there you actually have to get stuff done. It isn't enough to to uh, uh, give speeches. So, but but. Uh, sh the fact is that they're in the Bundestag, and uh, and that's uh, directly related uh, to Merkel's policy um, on on refugees. And by the way, she also fell short in her lack of consultation with her fellow EU members on refugees. She just yes. assumed that this was the obvious and right thing to do, and um, to to uh, look after the, the neediest, something she learned um, in uh, as a as a child uh, living in the parish of, of her pastor father, um, and uh, and she was shocked shocked when when mm -hmm. the others didn't see it that way. So, but it, but again, this is a, this is a, a weakness of hers is that uh, she uh, she's a hyper rational person. And uh, uh, who who um, sometimes fails to consult sufficiently with 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 people who are not as who who uh, you know uh, she 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 you know, she always says that she works from from uh, where she wants to end up and and figures out the way back from that. Well, not everybody is that is that rational, and that leads uh, to another of her blind spots, which is her underestimating she's a, she was an east german and she trans she she pounced at the opportunity of when the wall uh came down of a new life and she was impatient and rather <clears throat> intolerant of fellow east germans who were less able to seize mm -hmm. the day and, mm -hmm. and and that too has has served um the ifd and and um and she realized rather late in the in her tenure that she had to be um, uh, more compassionate toward toward her fellow East Germans and and but it was but it was pretty late in the day. I, I was going to say, um, you know, she's she's shown much more compassion in the last couple of years and a, a deeper, a, a more of a Fingerspitzengefühl, a more nuanced understanding um, yeah. of, of those left behind. 
yes. really as part of a, a global trend. Um, well, Tati, I have so many more questions for yeah. you, but I know that Jessica has viewer questions as well. And so um, let me bring Jessica in to, to share with us what some of the questions are from, from the viewers. Okay, Jessica. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, before we launch the Q&A session, I would like to thank our members and viewers for your continued support. We depend upon your donations and membership to cover our expenses so that we can continue to bring you these important discussions. So if you are able to make a donation, please go to our website at www.lawacth.org and click on the donate button or become a member. We greatly appreciate your support. Um, all right, our first question, Kati. Uh, what is the sentiment of Germans regarding the post-Merkel era? Excitement, trepidation, does it vary by region in Germany? Such a good question, and I think I think almost disbelief that that uh, this is happening, uh, because as as Steve and I just said, I mean she's she's the leader that they've grown up with. Um, so um, and German uh, coalition governments are so complex that this may take a while to uh, to consolidate. So it isn't okay. Elections are September 26, but we're not going to overnight uh, have a new government installed. Um, so I think she's going to be around. Um, but um, but to, to more directly answer your questions, I think there is trepidation uh, in the West. In the East, I think less so, uh, for the reasons that Steve and I were just discussing, that, that in, in the East there is, there is um, a, a very strong anti-Merkel sentiment still. And a, and a sense that she she never did enough for us, um, that she uh, uh, really kind of uh, turned into this this cold uh, Bessie, uh, as they call Westerners, and um, and and so they they the East is is more pro-Russian, and um, strangely, you know, since it was occupied by the Soviets, uh, but uh, and and so they will not mourn. Her passing, but but the West, I think, most definitely will. Did Angela have women who inspired her, such as Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, or Indira Gandhi? Definitely not Margaret Thatcher. She doesn't really love that comparison, although there is a comparison to be made because they were both scientists and came from from uh, uh, you know Margaret Thatcher was a grocer's daughter, so not a like. It broke broke into the male culture of, of, of British politics, but but um, Merkel is much more about uh, uh, results and not um, not ideology, and and um, uh, therefore she was not a role model. Her two role models were Catherine the Great. There's a, a picture of her on her on, in her office, a portrait of Catherine the Great, a German princess who uh, who married um, Peter II and and transformed uh, uh, Russia uh, almost as radically as as Merkel in her quiet way has transformed Germany, and um, and then and then of course Marie Curie, who was a um, a scientist like like Merkel and who also took on um, the establishment. And, uh, and and was Polish. Uh, Merkel has some Polish uh, uh, ancestry, so she identified with those two women. But but basically, Merkel had to invent her own. Uh, she, Merkel had no network of women um, supporting her. So that that's a, a, a another um, kind of a false attack on her is that she is that she isn't really sufficiently pro women. It's not true. It's just that she's not um, a very vociferous feminist. She likes to say, "I am Chancellor of all Germans." When asked, uh, "Why, you know, why, why haven't you ever given a major speech from the Chancellery about women?" That's just not her way. The bully pulpit is not her way. Her way of promoting women is by promoting the career of, for example, Ursula von der Leyen. Who um, uh, you know was her defense minister and 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 now is the is the chief executive of the European Union and wouldn't be there without Merkel's support and by the way Merkel's closest advisors are women um, Margaret Thatcher wouldn't be caught dead in the company of that many women in fact 
she prided herself on being the the only man in the room she liked to say uh surrounded only by men um but so so um her her way is 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 much more subtle um she promotes she promotes women by giving them first of all by her example that's her most powerful uh pro feminist uh uh, support and and she she doesn't feel that she needs to spell out that she's a feminist because you know isn't it obvious thank you this is kind of a follow-on question to, to your remarks um would you say that Merkel has defined women leadership in general or has she succeeded as a gender neutral leader and this person asks if she works on defining leadership traits for men and for women and where they are the same and overlap so if you could comment on that Another great question. I think that that uh, she has um, given a whole new image of what a woman in power looks, sounds, and acts like, and um, put to rest, put to permanent rest, the ability of women to hold such a position. Not only to to um, to win an election. We've had an ample example of that but to sustain it four times, 16 years, um, you know, breaking, break, breaking Bismarck's record and, and, and now equaling her mentor, Helmut Kohl's. Um, and, and by the way, the only German chancellor since 1949 to leave on her own volition, not to be driven out. She's, she's leaving because she wants to, because she's always said that she didn't want to wait till she was a political wreck. Every other chancellor was driven up. She so that's a that's a, 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 a you know in her in her leaving she is making another important statement about this is how democracy works. This is how uh, leadership works. I mean I don't need to point out the contrast between that leave taking and some others. Um, you touched on this a bit earlier, but uh, Chancellor Merkel, who was the Minister for the Environment before she became Chancellor, and yet many of her most ambitious hopes to address energy issues and climate policies in Germany haven't been achieved. What are her thoughts on that? Well, I, I think she would agree. I think that's to her regret. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I think, I hope that, uh, that in her final years she will um she will focus on that but um she did eliminate nuclear uh use of nuclear power after the fukushima disaster um and um and and that gained her that gained her uh friends among the um uh social democrats and and by the way she has largely um made uh, these parties, uh, social democrats, Christian democrats, CSU, FDP, um, meaningless because she, I think she's, she's a post, post-party politician. She, she's, she's robbed and stolen from all of them. And, uh, you know, the, the, the reforms that she has enacted, be it, be it, uh, minimum wage, be it marriage equality, um, uh be it um uh nuclear power these these were all social democrats uh um uh, uh social democratic issues and she's made them her own which is why um the man who is now leading the uh, olaf schultz her her finance minister um has has now stolen her her you know the merkel uh the gesture which which he now uses <laughs> the the um you know the little cathedral uh, that she makes with her hand now he's he's using that and he's he's overtaken um olaf schultz has overtaken uh the the cdu's uh man um because be, well, you know what? What do what do parties even stand for anymore? She's she's uh, made them in her, in her very cunning way. Um, she's uh, she's taken the best from um, from uh, from everybody and and made it made it work. Has Merkel not completely changed her asylum policy, paying Turkey to keep refugees and not opposing physical barriers, and even sending back by EU border countries? Has she done this reluctantly in the face of reality? 
Well, um, let me just say that she is a realist. She's a pragmatic politician. Uh, she, um, she makes deals like all politicians have to, to survive. Uh, the deal on Turkey uh, with Erdogan, she held her nose and, and she made the deal because she had to. Um, the, she, you know, she's, she's not a politician who, who, who lets the, her ideals, the perfect, be the enemy of, of the good. We can accuse her of, of, uh, of being imperfect, and I think she would uh, accept that. Um, we've pointed out uh, her blind spots uh, on the IFD, on, on, um, on, on uh, the, the discontent in the East. Um, she's, she's an imperfect but very successful politician who I think has, has, uh, has redefined uh, women in power and has placed Germany now as the moral leader of the world, which uh, we're talking about the former Third Reich. Pretty amazing. And one other thing which, which uh, is worth noting, um, Israel and Jews. Um, the, you know, looming over post-war Germany is always that question, can this country uh, ever be deemed normal? She would answer, yes, but. And that but is only if, um, if the crimes of the Third Reich are never forgotten, the uh, famous Vergangenheitsbewältigung, that is to say the necessity to continually rework the lessons of the past. And Germany has done that more than any other country on the planet. And, and as a result, I, I'm, I'm here going to make a bold statement, I think Germany would be the last European country uh, to, to fall, to succumb to populism because it has done that, that hard work. And Merkel has, has uh, made the Shoah, she always calls it the Shoah, which is how the um, Israelis refer to it, um, a, uh, a, a, a raison d'etre, a, a Staatsraison, a fundamental reason for, for Germany's existence. And uh, she, she early, in her, early in her chancellorship, she went to Israel, addressed the, the Knesset, first German chancellor to do that, and, and basically said, you are, um, is, is, Israel is, is one of the reasons that we exist, and Israel's uh, security is a permanent uh, mission, for, a sacred mission for, for Germany. So that, that too, I would, I would put in the um, column of, of her uh, remarkable achievements. Um, in just two weeks, Germans will vote in parliamentary elections that mark the end of Angela Merkel's 16 years in office, which is part of the reason we wanted to host you uh, for today's program, even though your book is coming out uh, a little bit later. Who will take control of German politics, and what will this mean for the European continent and Germany's allies? Well, all of these are unsettling questions, um, and uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but it now looks like the SDP, Olaf Scholz, is, is, uh, is, is ascendant. I don't know, uh, I'd, I'd love your views on this, on this Steve, um, but uh, Laschet, uh, the CDU North Rhine-Westphalian uh, president who, is, who, is, who Merkel has to support, <laughs> uh, hasn't caught on. Um, you know, the SDP is um, uh, a different a different party, but a but a very pro-European party. Um, Helmut Schmidt was SDP and was a very good European. Um, I think that that in the post-Trump uh, era, um, Merkel sent a strong signal to Washington that you are not at the head of what remains of the West any longer, which is, uh, you know, a, 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 a powerful statement from someone who was more pro-American than any other chancellor. Uh, but um, observing the January 6th attack on Congress, she, she made a very strong statement. She, for the first time, she said, I'm very angry. 
and I'm very sad. And then she went ahead and pushed the EU while she was in the um, EU presidency seat to make a, uh, a big deal with China, despite the Biden administration asking her to hold off on that. And that was a direct signal saying, new day, um, you're no longer calling, you're no longer the CEO uh, of the West. So, you know, um, it, it is a new day, and she, she who is so aware of history and the power of the big lie, which is what brought Hitler to power, uh, is, is uh, very concerned about uh, what happens in the aftermath of, uh, of, 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 of Trump and, and the fact that Trumpism is, hasn't vanished. So Europe, in her view, has to be more assertive has to be more unified and has to stand for more than trade and tariffs, has to have a core moral moral and 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 uh, obviously uh, security component. And here she and uh, Macron agree. Steve, did Maybe you want to add to that? Yeah, a, a quick two finger um, on the question about about the leadership in in Germany moving forward. It's really fascinating to, to look at the polls and see the real reversal of fortune between the Christian Democrats um, who were polling in the mid 30s and are now polling in the mid 20s and yeah. the social Democrats who were polling um, at about 15, 16% and have now surged past um, the, the Christian Democrats uh, with some Christian Democratic or with some polls putting the Christian Democrats at just 19 or 20% of the vote and yes. in between we had that blip of the Greens um, and, and Annalena Babak. And so there are three candidates for chancellor. Um, at this point, it does not look like Annalena Babak will become the chancellor of Germany, but it is highly likely that the Green Party will be part of the next coalition government. The question is with whom? And yeah. it, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the Social Democrats under under Olaf Scholz have made the the most amazing political comeback in Germany's post-war history. Um, if they do in fact um, become the the leading party in a coalition, but it's important to remind our viewers that the chancellor is not directly elected um, by right. the German voters. Um, the yeah. chancellor is elected by the Bundestag, and so we're really going to have to wait and see what the results are. Um, and then what the different options are in terms of coalitions that could be formed. Yes, but uh, I just want to jump in and say, uh, agree with everything you just said, Steve, but it, uh, this confirms that Merkel is sui generis, that she's a unique character. She is not a creature of the party. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that in some ways the SDP, Olaf Scholz's party, um, is, is, um, is maybe closer to her than uh, than the CDU CSU, um, so it's post-party um, uh, politics in Germany. I think you know this is the topic for another you know yeah. at least hour-long discussion um, of how the 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 lines between the parties have become incredibly blurred in yes. recent years, and um, how muddy the identity is of the different of the different parties. Yes, yes, but but her standing is continues. She she's not a lame duck. You'd think, on her way out the door, sixteen years on, she would be a lame duck. She she has defied that. Uh, you know, yet another um, a cliche that she's defied, and uh, and 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 she's she's the highest rated. I think she's in the eighties politician in Germany, and because she now embodies. Uh, the, the qualities that, that we associate with Germany, which is responsibility, you know, uh, uh, val uh, democratic values, hewing to fact, um, you know, all the things that are in danger, we attribute to, to Germany and, and, and to Merkel. So um, she, she really has now entered, I would say, not to be too grandiose, history. Well, I think on that note, we're at the end of the hour. And so uh, that is a wonderful place to leave this conversation. Kati, thank you so much. And Steve, thanks again. It's always great to partner with the American Council on Germany. Um, I'll put a link to Kati's book in the chat and I will turn this back over to Steve and to Kim. Thank you so much. Let me let me just say that that I really hope that this conversation has whet people's appetite uh, to, to buy Kati's book and to read it. Um, but one 
sort of thing that, that really struck with me is early in the book, Kati wrote, to understand the present era, we need to understand Merkel. And I think our viewers have gotten a taste of that during the conversation today. There are lots of issues that we didn't even get into during the, the time that we had together. Um, and there's a lot more in the book. So I encourage you to, to read it because just um, as there are no answers at the moment to how the German election will go, um, there are lots of questions about Angela Merkel and historians will be debating her impact for years to come. Um, so let me just thank you, Kati, for this, this wonderful conversation. Um, and from my side, let me thank you, Jessica and Kim, and your colleagues at the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall for hosting this event, which is part of a series of events about the German election, which is being organized by the World Affairs Councils of America in partnership with the American Council on Germany and Atlantic Brücke as part of WACA's Wunderbar Together 2021 Engage America series. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Kim, for hosting. It was such a pleasure for me. Audie and Steve, this was inspirational, fascinating, and so informative. I can't wait to get my hands on your book. So please go to the chat, as Jessica said, and everybody get this book. This is so important for all of us to better understand. Thank you both so much for today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. For our viewers, we have some terrific upcoming programs. Let me just give you a quick overview. We have The Future of Money with Frank Motek coming up September 23rd. We also have Fiona Hill coming up in October, as well as four-star general Stanley McChrystal. We'll be getting those October programs posted to our website very quickly. Uh, we also, every Tuesday, have Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with Dan Schnur at 5 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please go to our website at lawacth.org. Register today for programs. Become a member. Make a donation. We can't do this without you. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe. Take care. <laughs>